Virtually every problem we have today wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a root cause problem that nobody talks about. If you want to drive this kind of environmental change, show the incentive. The connection between environmental health and human health is really well documented and most people don't know it. It's not that we lack information, it's that there's too much information. Can AI serve a purpose in helping with this problem? Crisis tends to be what actually gets people to take action. I discovered that everything I've been doing in gardening for the last 25 years, which I thought was actually helping the environment, was not, but we will find a better way out of this. That is Shabar Ali, CEO of Garden for Wildlife, a spin-out from the National Wildlife Federation in the US with a mission to restore biodiversity, starting from people's own gardens. Shabar has spent over 30 years helping companies solve their most complicated and difficult problems through innovation, serving lead roles in companies like Accenture and Salesforce and founding several startups of his own. At the same time, he has nurtured his passion for gardening and combined it with a business opportunity to help tackle the pressing challenges of biodiversity loss by helping people gain access to native plants across the United States of America. My name is Peter Marcus Bach, and this is the Grand Challenges Podcast, a show about inspiring individuals who are stepping up to tackle the global challenges that our world is facing in their own unique ways. We reflect on the many out-of-the-box ways our guests have navigated the complexity and intricacies of the environment at the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. On today's show, Shabar and I cover a broad range of topics, starting from how we should define innovation to the story of how Garden for Wildlife started and where it is heading. We discuss the benefits of nature for humans and the impending twin crises of climate change and the rise of generative artificial intelligence, including the potential improvements in our livelihoods, but also how we must be prepared to adapt going into the future. Detailed information is provided in show notes over at peterambath.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining us today and please enjoy the show. Shabar Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. It's really good to have you. And I'm incredibly excited because when I first read your profile, it was incredibly inspiring to see what you have been up to. And when I saw the first part of your journey, I'm like, wow, okay, you are on many boards trying to help companies grow their innovation. And then you went from there to biodiversity and wildlife. And then I also heard on some shows that you've been on that you were at the climate conference COP last year in Dubai. So it's going to be a very interesting journey to get through. Yeah, you're much kinder about it than my mom. Her her response looking at my career has been, why can't you keep one job? Because, of course, you know, I have two brothers who are doctors and they've never done <laughs> one thing in their whole life. So <laughs> guess that's what makes life interesting, right? Indeed. If you explore new areas and you try to bring ideas from one field or one discipline to another, I think that's where the magic happens. Right. In fact, actually, in the innovation side, that's very often innovation, as I used to say to my clients, doesn't have to be new to the universe or even new to your industry. It just has to be new to your company, right? So oftentimes, some of the great innovations are simply repurposing what's been done in another place into your business or your industry. I do see parallels, actually, because when we go through academia, they always say that famous quote, standing on the shoulder of giants. Yep. And I think it's very true. Yeah, and I think Steve Jobs said it well in the innovation space, which is, you know, great artists steal. So oftentimes you just see something, you say, how can I use that in my thing? And it makes it that much better. Definitely. But I guess one aspect of innovation, which I think can kickstart this all, which I thought was really fun when I read about it, I think it was a Q&A article that you took part in, was your innovative ways of how you have an online meeting, especially during the pandemic. And that was actually by doing some gardening in your backyard. Could you tell me about that story? Yeah. So one of the things is that, especially even before the pandemic, it was fairly common in the consulting world. And I'm sure this is true in a lot of places that the higher you get, the more meetings you're in. And so you end up getting on these meetings where there's 10, 20, 30 people in the call and only really two people are talking. And so I had just bought a new place. We had a big lawn I wanted to convert into a garden. And so I grabbed my shovel, I grabbed my AirPods, I put them on mute and I'd start digging and doing things. And then I'd come off mute whenever my name was called and say, hey, you know, what do you think of this? But it was a great way to actually put a pond in my yard, which I dug by hand, and then put in a native garden, which is part of what led to what I'm doing today. And that pond was actually not a very small one. It was quite massive. And there's actually some pictures we can put in the show notes for listeners to look at. Yeah. And it turns out one of the great things about the internet is you can literally buy just about anything you want online. And in this case, pond liners, which you need so the water when you fill it doesn't just drain into the ground. I dug a pond that was, like you said, quite large. It was about 11 feet by 13 feet in oval shape. And I was able to go and put those dimensions at a website 
And they actually shipped me a pond liner that fit that perfectly. And then I just dropped that right in there. Very practical. Yes. But I guess the biggest win out of all that was that now your pond is an incredible habitat for a whole range of wildlife. Yeah. In fact, actually, I was surprised. And I think I shared a photo with you. After I put the pond in, I started planting some native plants around it. But later that spring, three turtles had made their way to the pond across a huge lawn and had come out of the woods, had, I guess, smelled the water and said, we have a new home. And so now we have turtles living in our pond. We also have foxes. We have all kinds of birds, even some bats have shown up. It's pretty amazing. No, definitely. And actually, for them to make their way there, I mean, you hear stories of backyard ponds and then animals coming to them. But to experience it yourself must be something pretty amazing. Yeah. And the other thing is the frogs, they also showed up. And I don't know where they came from because one summer evening, I started hearing this amazing symphony of croaking from down the lawn. And I went out there and it was just, they'd all moved in. And then the pond was full of tadpoles. And now every year, like clockwork, we get this incredible music all summer long coming from the pond as well. Reminds me of some research that I was doing about biodiversity and the connectivity of the urban landscape. And normally cities act as barriers to animal movements. But there are ways you can create these corridors. And in my particular case, when I was embarking on this project, we were actually looking at frogs. So kind of feels close to home for me hearing this story. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but I guess on the one hand, you were building the pond. But on the other hand, you were also attending this meeting. So how did you strategize the attention, you know, the attentiveness while you were in the meeting? The key with meetings when you're on the phone, and I'm sure a lot of people know this, is that most people will be doing other things and then listening to hear their name called. As soon as their name is called, oftentimes they'll say, I'm sorry, I just missed that last part. Can you repeat it? (laughs) When in fact, they weren't listening at all because most people on the calls are just waiting until it's their turn. And otherwise, they're not really paying attention. And I guess that's a good strategy you can use when you need to do some biodiversity and protecting the world from the dangers of climate change and a lot of these other issues that we face. Yeah, you can actually do things that are value added while you're stuck on meetings that you you know aren't actually spending a lot of time being a participant in. So gardening, close to your heart, definitely. And it leads into what you do today. But that's actually not where you started. You have actually been involved in working with a key word, which we've mentioned already, which is innovation. Mm -hmm. And in research, we always think a lot about innovation. Uh, You know, our project's innovative because of following reasons. But apparently you have, I guess, a love-hate relationship with that word and how people perceive or use the word innovation. Yes, and I've had it in my title for much of my career, but I actually really dislike the use of the word because it's used as a verb, as a noun, as an adjective, and people all think they're saying the same thing. And then every company now just throws it on their products, in their annual reports, everywhere, and it's become trite. But part of it is that because we don't agree on the definition of what is innovation, this is where I'd always start with clients and say, if you don't actually have a definition you can agree on, how can you expect anything to converge after that? And so a simple example I would give even in the class that I would teach the executive MBA course was I would have everybody write down a definition. And I'd start with just saying, everybody think of the color blue. Mm-hmm. And then I'd ask different people, what did you think of? And they say, oh, well, the ocean or the sky or the you know somebody who's wearing a shirt or whatever else. And I said, look, I thought we all agreed on what blue meant. But see right there, you obviously have different meanings of it, different shades of it. Now let's take the word innovation. And there were all kinds of definitions. And so what I found is there's usually as many definitions of innovation as there are people in the room. And people often struggle actually putting a word, like a real crisp meaning to it. They'll oftentimes go, well, it's, you know, it's new or it's this. And Mm. so I found a very simple working definition that is sufficient, but I'd prefer just staying away from the word innovation altogether. And the definition was just a new way of doing things that adds value. And it's really that simple. Now, it could be a product service process. It can be new to your company, your industry, your organization, your government, whatever. But it doesn't have to be new to the universe. And value is the most important part. If it doesn't unlock value in some way, whether it's freeing up time or creating money or however the recipient measures value, then it's not innovation. It could be new, but it's not innovation. I guess you said one of the key words, measurable. I think too often we think blue sky, but we forget the fact that any kind of new idea or product we put out needs to be something that's measurable, that has, I guess, a tangible component to it or metrics to work with. The same goes for knowledge in the research area. You know, there's nothing new with trying to reinvent the wheel by just applying a method to a different case study and when you're not really learning anything new from it. That's correct. I think part of it is, and you use a really good word there, which is metric, because one of the things that you will find oftentimes, just look at any major organization, for instance, the Fortune 500 type company, Global 2000. And when a CEO comes out and says, we're going to be X percent more innovative, 
innovative or come out with some pronouncement about how innovation is going to drive what they're doing. My first question is always, okay, show me the metrics of all of your direct lieutenants and show me how they changed. Because if they're still being measured tomorrow the way they're being measured today, you will have exactly as much innovation tomorrow as you have today because innovation requires investment, it requires resources, it requires all kinds of things and measurements on outcomes. And if you don't add those to their metrics, human beings always do what they're measured against. So how is anything going to change? That is true. And I guess it's also very important what you're measuring against because otherwise people are just trying to tick boxes, which we see, I think, happen all too often, not just in the business sector, but also in the environmental sector as well. At least in my area, when we look at putting nature in cities through these nature-based solutions, blue-green infrastructures, you know, Many like to have it because it's a good ribbon-cutting event. Yep. It ticks boxes of water quality control or biodiversity enhancement. Describe it how you want to describe it. Just because you put a plant there doesn't mean that the animals will necessarily like it, and we'll definitely get to that. Yep. But I think there's a certain level of depth and understanding that needs to come with the metrics that we use so that we understand the deeper meaning. Exactly. And one measurement, of course, is in the business world profitability. But in other places, you look at government where innovation can occur and has occurred many times Hmm. or in the not for profit sector or in healthcare, for instance, they use different language, whether it's mission driven or patient outcomes or whatever. But those are also metrics you would use. Is this actually innovative? And do you feel like we're moving towards that kind of world where now it's becoming more complicated because profits or single metric that previously defined industries whether it's the environment, whether it's business, is no longer the driving factor. We are starting to consider a range of different aspects or criteria. I think we're trying to. What I find interesting is everything in business, it may not be exactly the same, but it seems to rhyme, not repeat, and you get these patterns over and over. 30 years ago, we called it balanced scorecard, right? You had to take into account not just the profit, but the employees and the community and all those things. And these things ebb and flow because, unfortunately, in the business world, and this is something that I actually first saw, I guess, a glimmer of back in the 1990s, but I'm only now realizing what we're dealing with is the unintended consequences of some actions back then, is the incentives that drive the behavior of many corporate executives, especially when you get to the C-level and the board level, are contrary to the things they say matter from a community level or an environmental level or whatever else. The simplest one being, of course, people talk now about the disparity between CEO pay and employee pay, right? And how it's egregious and Elon Musk and its $55 billion package and all the rest of these things out there. 10 years ago, it seemed crazy when a CEO was getting $180 million. The thing is, they're not actually getting that salary. That's equity. And that equity is stock options. And the stock options are based on the performance of this, obviously, the share price, because the investors care about that. Well, back in the 90s, they started changing executive compensation to include more options because they thought it aligned them with the business. And on paper, it looks really good. What we're seeing, though, is that it's actually manifesting in a very different way, which is companies doing things like share buybacks to drive up the share price because then the executive's options are worth more money. And the pharma companies did that. I think this past year, they spent $6 billion more on share buybacks than they did okay. on the drug development, right? Wow. So where are your incentives align now? True. And I guess it makes it even more complicated when we start to talk about environmental issues. And how do we manage that and where the incentives are for people to then go into more sustainable practices? And then there's the whole greenwashing movement as well, where it's, again, (laughs) ticking a box. And it's like, we look good, but maybe behind the curtain, it doesn't look as rosy. Well, exactly. I'm going to buy a bunch of carbon credits, but it's really just sticks that we're putting in the ground in some other part of the world that may or may not manifest into a forest 25 years from now, right? But I can check a box and my passengers think that their air travel from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. or from Washington to Switzerland is now carbon neutral. It is not carbon neutral. No, but let's see what other innovative solutions, to use the term you love so much, will, (laughs) I guess, pop up. Back to you. So you have a passion for gardening and you've started your own companies. You've been vice president in Global Leads. You've been in boards of key companies that work in cloud-based softwares and in IT innovations such as Accenture and Salesforce. I mean, these are very big names. And now you're actually CEO of a spin-out that you founded together with the National Wildlife Federation. But how did it all start? What's your origin story? Yeah, so it's funny because it's three different threads that kind of came together. One is after I finished business school back in the early 1990s at Georgetown, I worked in Washington, D.C. and was fortunate enough to do some pro bono consulting on the side with some environmental groups that I've been connected through through a friend of mine. 
And it turns out, actually, they were housed at the National Wildlife Federation's headquarter building at the time in D.C., but they were little not-for-profits. And I was just giving them some basic business skills. I started gardening around the same time. I'm not sure exactly how that started other than uh, my dad gardened and it made no sense for him either. He was a doctor, he never gardened, but he just started gardening. And so I started doing it as a hobby and planting you know, flowers and shrubs and things that would help with bringing birds and butterflies and stuff to the yard. It was a rental house. So I've been gardening for about 25 years. Well, I continued to garden everywhere I lived. And a lot of it as well became gardening, growing my own vegetables, because I found that the things that you grow in your own yard taste infinitely better than the things you buy in the grocery store. Oh, that is so true. If you've ever grown a tomato or if you know somebody growing one, eat one of those and then you will never buy one at the store again because they just have no flavor. And so the more I started growing my own food, the more I became even more interested in growing my own food. And so every place I've lived, I've always made a small either vegetable garden, raised bed garden, et cetera. So when I moved to Maryland four and a half years ago, so this would be summer of 2019 with my family, we moved back here because I had been traveling a lot and my kids were growing up and I didn't want to not see them as much. So I said, I'm going to move to a place where I don't have to travel as often because I have many clients in D.C. here. So we get here and the house that we bought, very fortunate, it has two acres of lawn in front of it. And I hate lawn. First thing I saw was <laughs> this has to be mowed all the time because it rains a lot. So I priced out what it would cost to have a landscaping service come over and mow the lawn, you know, once a week during the summer and twice a week in the spring and the fall. And I quickly ran the numbers and said I could buy my own riding lawnmower for that in one year. And so that's what I did. I bought a riding lawnmower, but I still didn't want to actually mow the lawn. So what I then did was I said, okay, let me start putting in a garden. Well, at that time, a book had just come out from a scientist. I believe he's the chief etymologist at the University of Delaware. And the book's name is Nature's Best Hope. Okay. And I found out about it because Professor Tallamy, who wrote the book, is actually an advisor to the National Wildlife Federation. And I should mention as well that I've been a just an individual supporter. I've been a donor to the National Wildlife Federation since back in the 1990s. I still have my membership card from 1994 when I started. So I read this book and what happened was I discovered that everything I've been doing in gardening for the last 25 years, which I thought was actually helping the environment, was not. It was actually hurting the environment. And so it was a very disruptive moment for me internally because I was like, well, I'm an environmentalist. I support a lot of environmental causes and organizations. And then I discovered that I was doing something fundamentally wrong. And it wasn't that I was using, you know, Roundup or pesticides or anything like that. It was that the plants I was planting were not native species. Mm -hmm. And the book makes it really clear the connection between the disappearance of three billion pairs of nesting songbirds, the disappearance of the pollinators that provide the primary food source for their young, And then the disappearance of the native plants that are the food source for many of the pollinators, the the moths, the butterflies, et cetera. Not just flowers, but also shrubs and, of course, keystone species. So I read this book and I think, oh, okay, well, let me fix that. Let me go buy native plants. I drove to the local garden center, which is where I'd always buy my flowers and plants. And in this case, it happened to be a store called Lowe's, but there's Home Depot. There's all kinds of places. And I then proceed to Google every single plant in the garden center, only to find out that not a single one, three hours later, not a single one of them was native. There were plants from Japan, there were plants from England, there were plants from the Mediterranean and from South America and from beautiful flowers and things, but they were all non-native species or there were these weird, you know, cultivars and other things that they created. So I was like, okay, well, let me see if I can find it. So I go onto my computer at home and I look and I find a little native nursery out in central Maryland. So I drive out there and they have three or four species of plants and I buy those. But I start to realize that part of the problem is there's almost this arc from you have to be aware of the problem. Then you have to get educated on what does it mean to be native and not just native, but native to where you live. Because plants that are native to my part of Maryland may not be native to Virginia or to Pennsylvania or to Delaware or et cetera. It can change actually in quite close proximity. And also from elevation, right? The coastal ones versus the more mountainous ones. And so one of the things that I discovered was the National Wildlife Federation has something called the Native Plant Finder Database, which had been built with the help of Dr. Tellamy, which is every single tree, shrub, and perennial flower down to the zip code postal level across America. So you could just put in your zip code and you only see what's native to where you live. And so this is where the idea sprung forth. And I went to them and I said, I want to do a pro bono project with you. Now, I was still at Accenture at this point. I was one of the global innovation leads in digital transformation, all of that. So I had a very fortunate position where I could go and do pro bono work with clients. So I went to them and I said, 
I want to help solve this problem. It's not enough that you've spent the last, at that time, 47 years running a program called Garden for Wildlife that was educating people about the importance of plants. And somehow I had missed it, but they had all kinds of educational content. They had certified, at that point, I think about 270,000 properties, most of them residences and homes, but also about 10,000 schoolyards, some corporate locations as well as certified wildlife habitats, which I'll come back to as to what that means. But the problem was still, there were a lot of people like me. In fact, there were 170 plus million gardeners in America. The majority of them have no idea what a native plant is. Mm. And they go to these garden centers and buy these plants. Yeah. And I guess it's also because there's been a bit of a culture that's developed over the last decades on gardening, where people tend to prefer these, you know, non-native or exotic kind of plants. Some will say, I want a palm tree in my backyard, or others will say, I want this beautiful English oak. And it's actually the completely wrong location for it. That's exactly right. But it's actually a deeper problem, which we will come back to, which is how did this all start? Because mm. systematically over the last 200 plus years, terraform the US. And this has happened in other parts of the world as well. It's not unique to us, but that's created this problem that we have today. Yep. So I was at the National Wildlife Federation and I said, it's not enough to just educate them about this. We have to actually give them access to the right plants and make it easy for them to only see the plants that they want to buy. You can't have the customer do the work. Yep. So we ended up doing a project with them, a series of workshops and building a business plan for an e-commerce business because this was right when the pandemic started too. So of course, okay. people were now going to be locked in their homes and it turns out spending more time gardening and doing things outside, trying to get sunshine and be healthy. I certainly remember that. Yeah. I was growing my herb garden on my balcony during the pandemic. I know other people were baking sourdough bread, but for me, it was the herb garden. Yeah, I, I was actually doing that too. I bake a lot of sourdough bread, to be honest, but that's, ah, that's okay. because we lived in the Bay Area. It's a whole separate best birthday present ever my wife gave me was a one-day class on making sourdough bread and 13 years later, I'm still making sourdough bread twice a week. Ah, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> so... We did the workshops, we wrote the business plan, we said you need to build an e-commerce business and we showed them how to do it on top of Shopify and with Salesforce and all of that to allow people to just come in, put in their zip code and only see plants native to them select the plants they want, and there were pre-curated collections based on what you were interested in. So if you wanted to, say, save the monarch butterfly, there was a pre-curated collection of three different species. One of them was milkweed because it was important and specific milkweed for the species in that area. But then also two other species because the milkweed only blooms for a certain period of time. And what you want is food for the adult monarchs as well. So you had to have other blooming flowers at other periods throughout the spring through fall. This kind of work that was done with horticulturalists and others, and the science was really strong on this. And so we built this platform and launched the business. And I was actually customer number one. So those pictures that you will see of the plants around the pond, those were from Garden for Wildlife, and I was the first customer. Okay. Fast forward a year, and the business is now running, and they have sold to thousands of customers, and they're starting to grow. And I went back to them, and I said, you know, you really need to spin this out as a separate company. And there's a multiple reasons why. First is you're a giant not-for-profit. You're not actually designed to run a for-profit business. You don't know how to do that, right? And part of it is if you want to recruit the right people to be in this business, you have to be able to pay competitive salaries with an e-commerce business and not-for-profits don't do that. But two, if you generate too much revenue from this, it actually could jeopardize your not-for-profit status, which is an important thing. This is true, yeah. But most importantly is if you spin this out as a for-profit corporation and then let it grow by bringing in outside investors as well, you're the majority shareholder. So you can always control and make sure it doesn't go off mission or like Bear Monsanto doesn't try to buy you or whatever, which was actually a fear. Okay. But to say you have millions of members. So if you only sold to your own membership, you could create literally a billion dollar company selling native plants. And the gardening market in the US is about $50 billion. So that would still only be like, you know, a small fraction, but- Wow, that's a decent amount. It is. But if you are a $100 million company with good margins, you're a billion dollar value company, right? And you can mm. grow that. And that's not even half their membership buying one order a year. So you start to do the math and you go, this could be really big. And then your equity ownership of this business, when you take it public, will be the single biggest endowment you have as the not-for-profit. It's bigger than your asset base. It's bigger than everything. And that took about nine months. But finally, they're like, oh, we get it. We should do this. And then there was a little wrinkle where they said, yes, but we want you to come in and be the CEO and run it since you actually created the idea <laughs> with us and you know everything about the operations and the plan because you built it. So, of course, to me, this was like, 
are you serious? Yeah, I'd love to because this is a purpose-driven business. And it is in some respects very different than everything I've done before, except building startups. I've built multiple startups and a startup is a startup at the end of the day. You know, it's all about cash flow. It's all about getting the right team. It's about making sure you have product market fit and all that stuff. This one just happens to have a mission that is important for not just the environment, but for human health, because the connection between Mm. environmental health and human health is really well documented. And most people don't know it. That is very true. Actually, we're starting to see it show up in a lot of different types of books that you can read of all the different genres. And I can remember I've read nature books or, you know, science books, but I've also read a lot of self-development books that Mm -hmm. always cite the famous study of the experiment with two patients who had gallbladder surgery and tested the effects of nature on their recovery. I mean, That's a more medical example, but you see so many references of people feeling much better when they're surrounded by nature. I personally love to take walks along the creek near my apartment. Mm -hmm. I live in an apartment, so unfortunately I don't have a garden, but I try to make do with my balcony. But I love to take walks along the rivers, and I do feel that rejuvenating effect. And I think people are starting to see it. There are great books that have come out. I find it interesting. It's a much longer discussion about how modern Western science had this weird hubris that everything had been learned by civilization over thousands of years couldn't possibly be legitimate because it wasn't scientifically proven using the scientific method. But how did we get aspirin? How did we get lots of things? It's because, Mm -hmm. you know, there's tribal knowledge, right? And one of the things that the philosophers have known for thousands of years, and more recently, you know, something like Thoreau with the walk in the woods and the rest, the scientists have started to figure out the next step is to get the policy people to actually implement what the scientists are figuring out because you're right. The documentation is actually there about the positive impacts of nature on your health, whether it's Florence Williams' book that came out in 2017, The Nature Fix, actually documents a lot of the science that's being done, whether it's oh, yeah. forest bathing in Japan and the measurements of people's biologicals after, not just when they hike, but a month later and showing decreased blood pressure and cortisol levels and those kinds of things are actually measurably improved from that exposure to nature. Definitely. And now we're seeing this in a more acute way with the urban heat island effect, which is wreaking havoc. We've got heat waves increasing in frequency across our cities, and we're seeing a lot of examples of just how a single tree has so many functions that it can be used to cool down the immediate area. You've got shading on the one hand, you have the evapotranspiration on the other, And just generally, it's less heat storage. So you're not dealing with the heat over a prolonged period of time. And people are realizing this. And I think these acute events are what gets us to understand this nature-human connection a lot better. Right. And then you get into the issue of, you know, there's a the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, which oh, is <laughs> how ominous. That's exactly right. But then you have to plant the right trees in the right places, because if you put the wrong trees in, you will get some of the benefit you're talking about. A tree will provide shade, no question. But mm-hmm. if it's a species that doesn't actually belong in that area, it could also actually hurt the ecosystem and the environment. And so it's important to not just say, for instance, I want to put tree cover in in this city for environmental justice reasons, for instance, you know, many of the urban areas in the U.S. have very little tree coverage. So there are groups putting in trees. And the start of Dr. Tallamy's book actually talks about Portland, Oregon, which is a great example. Mm. Portland is, I think, one of the most tree covered cities in the U.S., but they're the wrong species. And as a result, what you see are urban birds in that city. You'll see the pigeons and the crows, et cetera, and sparrows, which, of course, are ubiquitous. What you won't see are the actual native birds from that area because those trees don't provide the food sources for their offspring, so they don't come in. And this is something that I think we're starting to realize, hopefully not too late in the process, but people are starting to really understand, well, you know, native species. We've had this debate on a previous episode of the podcast as well. The urbanization, in a way, completely destroys that profile. And now it's a question of whether you work with native, non-native, There seems to be a leaning towards native because we should be restoring the natural cycles of the environment that we're in. But yeah, sometimes it's tricky whether the ecology of the area has been changed so much that we actually just have to transition it to the next safest natural state, which may no longer be what it used to be. And it's not about rewilding in the sense of let's tear down buildings and let's put in, you know, what was here before. It's not like a Luddite, let's go back to some romanticized era. But The native species still have an impact. So I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine that I worked previously with at Accenture and at Salesforce, Mm -hmm. another innovation guy. After we launched and I came in here, I said, you know, you should get some plants for your balcony. He has a loft in the city, in the loop, right, which is a very urban area. And he said, look, I have no garden. And I said, it doesn't matter. Just get a planter, put it on your balcony and get a small pack of native plants for your area. And he's like, "Okay, I will, but I don't expect anything. 
A month later, he texted me a photo and he was just shocked in a very happy way. He's like, I have a monarch on my balcony. Beautiful. I said, look, they know where it is. It's like the turtles finding the pond in my yard. Nature is very resilient if we don't push it past a tipping point. That's true. And so for us, it's putting back these pieces. And then this actually goes to another part of what we launched last year that I'm really excited by is, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with things like Bombus with their socks or Warby Parker with their glasses or Tom shoes, where they donate a pair of glasses for every pair of glasses they sell to people who need them in, say, third world countries or the places where they simply cannot get access to eyewear. And, you know, that's transformational. If you can't see and you mm-hmm. put on a pair of glasses, you can read. That's life changing or a pair of socks. Right. Yeah. And, and so we said we're going to do the same thing now. What do we sell? We sell plants. So what we decided to do was to tackle this very issue of the environmental justice in places that don't have these plants is to say for every plant we sell, we're setting aside the same number. And then we're going to do installations of gardens, native plant gardens, sometimes three, four, five hundred plants at a time in places that otherwise wouldn't get them. Because the trick is the pollinators and the birds don't really care what your zip code is and they don't care how rich you are. They need to go where they need to go. And so what we're doing is trying to fill in those big gaps in the map with these kinds of gardens and at the same time create beautiful native spaces for the residents of that area who otherwise would never see nature to be able to experience it because it's good for their health. Indeed. And it brings back the obvious saying, biodiversity goes beyond boundaries. And I like the way that this is one really good idea of pushing that environmental justice aspects. Too often when we plan out nature in cities, now be it for urban heat, be it for biodiversity or be it for water management, we tend to do it systematically based on where's the water flowing, where's it hottest, and also where we can fund these projects. And sometimes Mm -hmm. the lower income areas start to lose out. And so you get this complete shift and these extremes in the city. That's, yeah, gentrification will occur. I mean, I see that at a societal level, but we can also see it at an environmental level. I'm just thinking in the back of my head, my visit to San Francisco once where you could see certain neighborhoods became gentrified because a lot of the techies and the tech startups moved in and then people who were living there had to find a new place because of rising house prices. There is an economic dynamic to it, but I guess if you can somehow apply it evenly across the field, then you're kind of raising the value of the entire city in the process. Right. I'll give you a great example is the very first plant bank, which is what we call it, the plant bank garden that we did was actually in inner city Baltimore. It was an area of row houses, which are townhomes that are all built together and occupy a whole block. And one block, all the townhomes were gone. So it's now just a vacant lot surrounded by these townhomes. In an economically kind of challenged area, there was a fair bit of crime in that area, other things. But the residents who were there, most of them were elderly at this point. And there's no way they're ever going to leave, right? There's mm. nowhere for them to go. They're not going to sell place. And so putting a garden in right there, they were so happy. You know, many came out and volunteered with us. We had volunteers from other companies like Amazon and others showing up as well. And we worked with a couple of local not-for-profit community groups to do the planting. And we put in trees, shrubs, about 400 native perennial plants. I'm really excited to go back in a few months and see how it looks now. Put in a picnic bench, all of that, in order to create a place, a space for the people in that community to go to. It does actually improve the value of the area, but it actually improves the value to their lives. And that's what matters. And I guess all of this has been wrapped around a theme that's been in the back of my head, which is really that field of dreams hypothesis. If you build it, they will come. Very familiar in ecology for those who don't know it, based off the movie Field of Dreams from 1989. Yep. I think with Kevin Costner. But it's been widely accepted in ecology. I think recently criticized, but generally accepted. And that is, if you put a pond in your backyard, the frogs will come. But likewise for people, if you create the space, I think they will congregate. They'll want to gather and have that sense of community grow as a result of it. Yeah, I, I thought for a second you were going to say if you put a pool in your backyard, people will come because that's... Oh, I'm sure that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I grew up around apartment buildings, so we had these communal pools. So yep. <laughs> I only ever lived in a house twice. Once was in the tropics and once in Australia. And the garden was, yeah... It needed a lot of maintenance. I think that's why it ended up going back to apartments. Yeah, no, I I will say, I will actually, one of the things I'm very much looking forward to, and I know we'll get to this a bit later, but if the predictions are close to accurate in about five to six years, you'll have robots like Optimus from Tesla and others that will be available and at at a reasonable price, reasonably say $20,000, $30,000, which I think is what they're aiming for. But if I could have a robot that would simply take care of my garden for me and would weed my vegetable patch and do all the things that need to get done so I could just enjoy it, that would be worth you know the price of admission because there is some labor involved when you're doing things like that. But it's less labor than if you have to every year go and plant annuals that 
also then require pesticides and fertilizer because it's not where they're meant to be. Yeah, this is true. And so it actually takes less over time. But I guess, yeah, you highlighted AI is growing at a rapid rate. And you certainly have a lot of interesting opinions about that too. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to discussing that. But we digress for now. But it would be nice to have one. We do see these robots grass yes. cutters now at least. I tend to pass along places and I see these little machines moving around along the lawns. But as we said, lawns are not exactly the best. No, they're not. Not by a long shot. Now, the American fascination with the lawn actually goes back to the English times when the first colonists came over and built the colonies before it became a separate country. And you think about it, even people like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, et cetera, our founding fathers, as we call them, they had these estates and the estates were these massive rolling lawns because that was what they had back in the English countryside and the big estates. And they wanted to model that. And there is kind of a historical evolutionary reason why we want to be able to see everywhere because you can avoid threats if you can see. And in the jungle, it's hard to see mm. that. But that's carried forward on an almost absurd basis to, I grew up in Southern California and my mom still lives in the same house I grew up in, in a Long Beach, uh, you know, suburban. If you've ever seen a show like The Brady Bunch, all the houses basically look the same and they've got this rectangular lawn in the front of them that's, you know, 10 feet by 30 feet or whatever. And Twice a week, that lawn gets watered and excess water runs into the drain and goes off down the street in the storm drain. And it serves functionally no purpose because I've seen very few people actually out on this little patch of lawn in front of their house. But Long Beach is part of a desert. Mm. And if you look in Arizona or Southern California or lots of places like that or even Nevada, people pay to water the desert to grow grass that they don't actually do anything with. And it makes no sense. But this is part of this mentality that's just now, when somebody builds a development, their first thing is, okay, well, I have to put in this much lawn. And nobody ever stops and says, why? It's just an orthodoxy. It's just a, but that's how we've always done it. And so places like my hometown actually have programs now where they pay you to remove your lawn and put in drought tolerant plants, the ones that you know, are meant to be there. And they'll pay, you know, $3 a square foot to do that in, in Long Beach, for instance. And they'll pay for the design work to get you a nice looking yard, which then helps the wildlife, the hummingbirds and the butterflies and all those other species but also saves the city water. And so you get to the economic thing, which drives a lot of this. If you want to drive this kind of environmental change, show the incentive. These cities and counties, even with the rainstorms going on right now in Los Angeles, that place is in a mega drought. And so for them, it's about conserving water. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't look like it, but we are experiencing certain kinds of climatic conditions that people just don't mm -hmm. see because there's a lot more happening at a much regional level. It's nice to see these kinds of incentive programs, but I guess also probably one of the key aspects, and I know you've mentioned this in some of your previous shows, and I think it's probably what the program owes its success to, is you're reducing the friction for people to get started because you're giving them the information they need, you're making their life easier by allowing them to order it in, especially these services to tear out the lawns as well. I mean, Garden for Wildlife is essentially innovating in that sense by reducing the friction so that people can actually then adopt this, even if maybe they don't realize it at first that they're actually doing good for the environment. Maybe they just want to build a garden. <laughs> and friction is the thing that if you look at anything that's successful out there, it's oftentimes about taking friction out of a process that up until they did it, most people thought, but that's just the way you do things. It's almost an orthodoxy, which is you know a topic I could talk about forever. But you know, <laughs> take an example by analogy, look at something like Uber. Well, what did Uber do? You know, taxi cab companies have been improving in theory over the years, right? They add credit card readers, they have some stuff, but Uber stepped really far back and said, what is the overarching journey and where are all the pain points? And the pain points, not just let me get a cab or wherever I am. It's let me know where it is relative to where I am. So if I was sitting in a restaurant with you having a conversation or in a meeting room, I don't have to go outside and wait for the cab to arrive until the cab arrives because the Uber yeah. shows you where it is and you get a little notification, all that. But also if it's raining or something else, that actually really matters. I don't want to be out in the snow or the rain when I'm waiting for my cab. But then the next part was, okay, when I get to my destination, let me just get out. I don't have to get a receipt. I don't have to pay. In many places, we're still taking just cash. I don't know if you've had this experience. The number of blank paper receipts I had that I had to fill in myself later oh. on when I was doing expense reports. They don't have that, but usually the printer runs out of paper and then you got to wait. There you go. Yeah. Or they have to switch on the card machine because you want to pay with card and not cash. And then they oh, have right. to take another yeah. machine to print out the receipt. So yes. Right. And all of that's friction. And then, yeah. you know, what they did was they stepped back and said, every one of those was solvable with technology that existed at that point on the iPhone or on Android. Mm -hmm. And they took the friction out. So our view was, how do we get someone to buy the right plants. Well, first off, we have to provide the kinds that they want to buy, which is based on color, size, when they bloom, that sort of thing. 
But then we had to also make it easy for them to just know what was native to their area. Because again, everything is native somewhere. Even those plants at the garden center are native, just not to this part of the world. So we had to show them only what was native to them. And that's, we have this database so we could filter everything that way. And then we had to make it available on the schedule they wanted. So deliver it right to their doorstep. And the next piece of friction, which is the part that I'm really excited about that we're working on for right now is I think in almost every aspect of life, and I'll certainly point to myself on this as well, people lack imagination. Mm. And what I mean by that is, this is why you have designers, whether it's an interior designer, a landscape designer, you know, any of these kinds of things. But when you see something you like, you know it, right? That's so true. the whole point is show them something they like. The problem with buying plants at the garden center and physically or on a website is what you see is a plant or you see a few plants. What you don't see is your yard mm. with those plants in it. And so what we're working on right now is design tools that allow you to either do it yourself or have somebody else do it for you, where it's about designing the yard you want rather than picking the plants you want to buy. Once you're done, then you have a shopping cart that's already full with the things you want because you've bought the outcome not the plants. That's interesting. I guess it's like, you know, if you go to Ikea and you want to make a new kitchen, you can sign mm -hmm. it on the little computer and then they show you all the parts you need for it, but actually apply it to biodiversity. Exactly. And I guess you can show them different states that it could be in or different configurations. Yeah, so you can then, that part of it is show me the spring, summer and fall view yep. and even the winter view of these plants because then you know, well, these ones will be blooming in spring and then those will fade out and these ones will bloom later, et cetera, et cetera, as you're going along. But also show me the impact. Show me the number of species I'm supporting. Show mm. me the, the amount of carbon that we'll be sequestering, which is something we want to add later this year because it turns out perennial plants, unlike the grass, the lawn, which has a root system that maybe goes down four to six inches. If you ever mm. pull up turf, you'll see you can pull it right up to the roots. It's very shallow, and then the dirt gets compacted below it. Yep. Perennial root systems, some of them go down as much as 15 feet. And so what they're doing oh, is wow. they're opening up the soil, which allows water absorption, also allows mm -hmm. lots of beneficial insects. But what it also does is those perennial root systems sequester carbon, and they grow yep. a lot faster than trees. That is true. Much smaller, they take less time to establish. We know that from the stormwater management side, where we tend to use plants yep. with root systems that help break up the soil, mainly for the infiltration but also for the exchange of pollutants so that plants can uptake nutrients or any other things that could be coming in from the stormwater that flows into it or whatever other kind of water you would like to treat with it. But it's fascinating to see just how deep they can go. Yeah, and what you're hitting on right there with stormwater, actually where I've moved here in Maryland, they actually have a program called Rainscapes because uh -huh. for decades now, ever since the first time I lived here in the early 90s, I've known about the efforts to what they call save the Chesapeake, the Chesapeake Bay watershed and ecosystem, all this runoff from all this development, all these cars and everything else goes straight to storm drains and straight to the Chesapeake and it pollutes the bay. So the Rainscapes program here where I live will actually give homeowners up to $7,500 to plant these native plants that have the deep root systems in their yards where the water runoff is occurring to divert it from the storm drains and have it absorb locally to help protect the watershed because it's That's cheaper to really solve it at incentive. the source. Then, yeah, then to try to clean up the water downstream afterward. You know, it's no different than in the manufacturing world. So many years ago, I, I have a Lean Six Sigma black belt as well from my early consulting days. And there's a term called the cost of poor quality. And you'll know this mm. just intuitively. If something is made in a factory and they detect a problem and they have to fix it when it's already been sold to a customer and it's at their house, it's a lot more expensive. It's like a car recall is a lot more expensive when it's there than to fix the problem in the factory. That's the cost of poor quality. It escalates every step you move away. So if you can solve water pollution and runoff upstream before it ever gets to the bay, it's a lot cheaper than trying to clean the Chesapeake Bay. No, definitely. And source control measures, I mean, they call them yeah. either source control measures or stormwater control measures, usually begins by addressing the actual problem rather than treating the symptoms of the problem. Exactly. And it's really that fundamental design aspect of, you know, be it what you call it, low impact development in the US, water sensitive urban design in Australia. There's so many terms. I mean, I've discussed this with so many guests on previous episodes. <laughs> so listeners, if you do want to get a bit of an idea of what everyone thinks geographically, go check out some of the episodes. We'll put some in the show notes for you. But yeah, sorting it out at the source, sometimes people's back Backyards aren't exactly the easiest place to get to, hence really the value out of the program. Right. I know from some conversations with municipalities is that sometimes they tend to ignore what's in people's backyards because A, they don't know if these assets are being maintained, and I'm calling them assets because people tend to think of them as engineered systems, but they don't know if the gardens or assets are being maintained. Mm -hmm. B, they don't know if they're designed properly, so they can't really understand the real performance of it. And yeah, as a result of that, it becomes too much of a management nightmare that they'd rather just ignore it and then do something at a much larger scale. 
But in a way, it starts in the backyard. And that's what you've somehow managed to address really well with Garden for Wildlife. I mean, looking at some of the stats, and maybe these are already outdated, but you've shipped over 62,000 plants across 38 states and 2,900 plus cities in America, which is no small number. I mean, as a single organization that can do that for how many gardens... That's an incredible amount of area. Oh, thank you. We're only getting started. This company has just completed its second year of operations, second full year. So last year we did roughly a million dollars in sales. This year we're looking at somewhere between three and five million. But we have much bigger ambitions longer term. And part of it is being able to tap into those programs like we just talked about. In the U.S. alone, there's actually about a billion dollars a year in government programs trying to get people to do the right things with their yards. Most people don't even know about them. And so I think... To the point you were just talking about where it seems like it's a management headache and the rest, a lot of municipalities and governments simply ignore the potential value of a million individual homeowners doing a little bit of good to move the needle on this bigger problem Mm. because they only know how to do big projects. It adds up. Lots of little projects. But it actually, it absolutely adds up. And it cascades. And then ultimately, all the little processes in knowing the complexity of our environment and classical complexity theory says... You know, it's not just simply the sum of parts. It's something even bigger than that. So very excited to see where it's going from there. What's next for Garden for Wildlife? Well, so one of the things that I'm really excited about, which we just launched two weeks ago, and one of the great things about being a spin out is we have that startup mentality. So from idea to execution is weeks and months and not quarters to years, right, which is more traditional, larger organization for a range of reasons that are just part of how they, you know, you build those kinds of bureaucracies over time. But about about three and a half months ago, I was talking with my wife because we have two kids. They're now 14. But when they were in elementary school, she was the fundraising chair for their PTA, which is a parent teacher association for people who don't know. And many schools, the PTA actually raises money to help do programs at schools because we, of course, classically underfund our educational system in many parts of the U.S., And so she and I were talking and she said, well, a native plant fundraiser sale would be fantastic for a PTA. Instead of selling candy bars or wrapping paper or whatever they normally do, this one's good for the environment. And we can donate gardens to the school as a byproduct, which is then good for the kids from a science point of view, but from a health point of view as well. I was going to say health as well. (laughs) Exactly. Candy, plants. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Imagine having a native garden at the school. And the National Wildlife Federation, again, has about 10,000 schools that have native gardens in them. So we already have this connection point, too to schools where now you have something where you can engage them and say, let's raise more money, let's maybe expand your garden, do whatever else as well. So from that idea and a couple of flyers that we mocked up, we actually have accelerated to the point now that two weeks ago we launched a platform for any not-for-profit, not just PTAs, but for environmental not-for-profits, you know, animal rescues and rotary clubs and boys and girls clubs. And, you know, it doesn't matter. Any not-for-profit organization from small to large can literally go there, sign up, and all they get is they get a marketing link and materials that have already been pre-made for them if they need them that are customizable. And they just send that to their supporters. So we're not asking for your list of supporters or of your you know mailing list or anything else like that. Just like, here's a marketing link. If you send it to your people and say, hey, if you're going to garden, buy native plants. And if they buy those plants, we give 15% to the not-for-profit, mm-hmm. right? So just right off the top, it's a new revenue source. And why I think this is exciting and why I call this innovative, and you know how much I love that word. <laughs> but the reason I call this innovative is that having supported not-for-profits for years, I mean, we've been fortunate enough that we can donate to a number of charities. And having worked with not-for-profits, one of the things that's hard is that people normally, if you think about your wallet and your income, You don't have a single pile of money or a single wallet. In your mind, it's compartmentalized. I have money I spend on my mortgage or my rent. I have money I spend on food and entertainment and on travel and on clothes and on the car, et cetera, et cetera. And then over here, I have this little piece that's called donations Mm -hmm. that I give to charity. Now, every now and then I might, outside of that wallet, give to somebody like I might meet on the street and I might give them a small donation or whatever, but mostly I make my donations that way. And so all not-for-profits are fighting for that same piece of your wallet. And our aha moment was, well, the $50 billion gardening market, that's a different part of your wallet. Mm -hmm. So what if I could take some of that money and put it in the pocket of a not-for-profit? So your supporter, your member, whatever, is going to be buying those plants anyways. Help the environment because they'll buy the right plants. And help your organization because now you get a share of that revenue. And it's as simple as just go online, go to our site, get the marketing link, and you're done. And then we just send you quarterly the money. What's really cool, though, is we've just partnered with a not-for-profit here in the U.S. 
that focuses on foster children. And that's a whole separate story. I mean, it's a tragic tale of like just how bad the foster system is, but also the experience of the foster children themselves, right? The metrics are, are crazy in terms of like, you know, I think it's 80% of all death row inmates are foster children. Oh, wow. Only like 11% graduate high school, 4% go to college. It's really, it's traumatic on every level. But this organization was started by a gentleman who actually was a foster child, but he's also then became, he was successful. He became an investment banker, very successful. And then he started this group, this not-for-profit called Comfort Cases. And what they do is simply address the problem of the foster child themselves, which is when you are put in the system, oftentimes you have 10 minutes to grab your belongings from the house and leave. And oftentimes it's just put in a black plastic trash bag. And that's your that's stigma, scary. Yeah. right? This is your stuff and that's all you have. And so the comfort cases was nothing more than a preloaded backpack that had, depending on your gender and age, all the right stuff for you as a child, whether it's a teddy bear and a blanket and coloring books and pencils and toothbrush and toothpaste and a comb or feminine products if you're older and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, at every age group. It has become international now. It's been incredibly successful. But what they did with us that I think was really cool is instead of, hey, buy plants and we get this amount of money, they actually translated into if you buy this much in plants, we get a pair of socks for a kid. If you buy this much, we get a backpack for a kid. So it's putting it in the mind of the supporter who already believes in the organization to say, this is what you can do. And I just think that's it's a great way to connect what you're doing with your gardening to a cause you believe in. And we've done the calculations and reduced the friction for you so you know you're really exactly. getting its worth. Very, very yeah. exciting. And it's a different way of then taking a business that's really working well for good environmental causes and then expanding that, I guess, spreading the love, spreading the awareness, or even just spreading the innovation yeah. around. To other causes completely that are unrelated. It could be, again, foster children. It could be animal rescue. It could be mm. pick your pick. And it's incredible to see that. So looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Will you be coming to Europe or other places in the world as well? Yeah, it's funny because, uh, and you mentioned at the beginning, so I was fortunate enough to go to COP once ago in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And it was very eye-opening on a number of levels. One of the things that came out of it was in conversations I had with people when I told them about what we were doing was, how soon will you be in England? Or how soon will you be in continental Europe or in the Middle East? Because there are all these projects going on in other places now to bring back habitat and native landscapes as well to support biodiversity and all that. And my answer is as soon as possible, but not in the next couple of years, we're still finishing out the rest of the US and then Canada. But our intent is absolutely to be global because bringing back native plants everywhere, that's our mission. And that actually is an important point we like to reinforce with our customers. But also whenever I talk to anybody about this is the reason Garden for Wildlife, the company was created was to further the mission of what the National Wildlife Federation is doing as a not-for-profit, which is to restore biodiversity and habitat. We just do it using capitalism yeah. because we believe that's actually a very effective model for doing some things. And it's a way to, yeah, incentivize people. When you think of economic theory, the first word that always comes to mind is incentives. That's right. So, yeah, and I think that's a way of then getting people to believe they're doing something good with their money and at the same time for the environment. So ticking those yep. sustainability boxes, but in an effective way. COP itself... I was actually debating going last year. I'm sad I missed out on it because I did go to the Dubai Expo in 2021, actually. Yep. Because I think that it got delayed a bit. But I really enjoyed that experience. And I mean, it's fascinating there and in Dubai. But what's it like to be at one of these cops? <laughs> well, first off, Dubai is a very futuristic city, as I'm sure you recall. Uh, and I have to give kudos to my colleagues from Accenture Dubai because they actually helped with setting up Expo 2020, which became 2021 because yep. of the pandemic. But um I partially sometimes wonder if like the native species of Dubai is high rise apartment buildings just because <laughs> they're all, all these they just every time I go there, there's more of them and they're all <laughs> brand new looking in the rest. But seriously, COP was very interesting because for years, all I've heard about at these meetings is carbon, 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 carbon. We have to cut down on carbon emissions. Separately, you hear conversations about water, 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 water. And then you hear about biodiversity and you hear about habitat. At this conference, it was actually in the Climate Investment Summit, which was taking place as part of COP, that I actually heard some speakers on the stage talking about this as they're actually all one thing. You can't just solve for climate. You can't just solve for water. You can't just solve for biodiversity and, and habitat loss because they're interconnected. Because what was happening is that people were doing projects, and you mentioned the term greenwashing. It's a great example of what happens with unintended consequences People would say, and I actually met with a minister from an African nation, who, she was telling me about this, where 
they planted a bunch of trees in order to offset carbon, mm-hmm. but they planted gum trees. And oh. as you know, gum trees are not from Africa. They're great in Australia. And so what happened, it actually was horrible for the water table and the environment there. And then they've had to since rip them out. It's important, obviously, to address the carbon problem, but to do it in a way that actually also addresses the rest of the ecosystem wherever you're trying to deal with that problem. Plant mangroves where mangroves belong. Plant eucalyptus where eucalyptus belongs. Plant our native plants where they belong. Don't put them somewhere else because you're making a shortcut in one place and causing more problems down the road in another place. And it turns out that things like, as I was mentioning with my hometown in California, growing lawns in the desert is not good from a water point of view. Putting in native drought tolerant plants is actually really good. Now you're conserving water, you're creating habitat, you are sequestering carbon, and it's good for the biodiversity. I mean, they all connect. And when you start to find projects like that, then you have opportunities for investing in the right sort of things. But it's nice to see that this sense of integration is becoming more focused or becoming more of a centerpiece at these discussions. And I think that's what we need. I mean, as researchers, we've been trying to show that for years. We also talk about the interdisciplinary work, and I myself take an interdisciplinary stance towards my research, looking at it from biodiversity, water, climate, heat, all as a connected system. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I feel like As with so many things that have happened in this world, I was speaking at a conference yesterday actually on generative AI, and I was a part of a panel. It's a company I'm an advisor to. And the thing that I realized, and I started the conversation on my part, was the issue that's happened over the last few decades, really, but it's been going on just at an accelerated pace for all of human history, but really the last few decades took off, is it's not that we lack information. It's that there's too much information. Mm. And because there's too much information, we can't get to the information we need easily. Right. So as an example, I said to the audience, you know, the conference again was on generative AI. So I Googled generative AI, just the term to see what is it. In 0.7 seconds, I had 491 million links, which, of course, there's no way I can read through, no. not in an entire <laughs> lifetime. But the point being, there's no shortage of answers. Right. And so then it's up to you and, and I to find that. The same thing is true in almost every field now, whether it's medicine, where it's 100 years ago, a doctor was a doctor. Yeah. Now, think about all the different specializations and all the training that's required and all the knowledge. In every one of these areas, as things have become so specialized, we've lost the kind of holistic thinking that leads to being able to see the connectivity between biodiversity, habitat, climate, and water, or between any one of these kinds of ecosystem based complex environments. Yeah. And that's where I think many of the problems occur because we have a system that in many respects is driven by a single thing, which is profit maximization. And so you find a vein and you mine it completely ignorant of all the stuff that's happening outside. It's it's that, as they used to say, the privatized profit, socialized costs. And this happens across the board. And climate change is an example of that. You get tunnel vision because you're too deep into your own practice that you tend to not look at the bigger picture. I mean, we see this often in businesses, but also in researchers that sometimes fail to see the bigger picture. And, you know, when you tell them to try and tell that story and put it in the context, they lose the plot. Yeah. And it's funny because you just reminded me of going back to earlier in this conversation, those first not-for-profits that I did pro bono consulting with 30 years ago, they were in a hallway that was made up of all these little not-for-profits and everyone had a tiny office that had lots of mail slots on the wall because this was again back in the day when you sent letters to everybody to fundraise. Ah, And I'd say 90% of their time was spent raising money to cover their basic salaries And very little actually went to mission. I was helping three that were in a row next to each other in that one hallway. And they were all basically doing the same thing for the rainforest in South America. And I, Mm. and I, one time I I remember asking, I said, why don't you just merge? Why don't you make one not for profit and spend more time and money on the mission and less raising money for the mission? Because your overhead here, your administrative overhead is the same three times. And they looked at me with a straight face and said, oh, they're different. Oh, no. (laughs) And it's because they were so hyper-specialized on their aspect, they lost the bigger plot. And so instead of any of them having a real impact, they were all so focused on their version. And to touch upon what you've already hinted at, do you think with the dawn of AI, this might improve? I think it will because it will improve, but it'll also create a lot of problems along the way. So I'll start with the improvement because it's the positive part. So my father was a physician. He was the chief of oncology at and chief of internal medicine at his Kaiser facility in Southern California. And mm-hmm. I remember that hospital. I used to visit him at work all the time. 
every day. Now, oncology in the 80s and 90s was much, much worse than it is today, right? There was very low survival rates and all the rest of it. So I had no idea how he did it because that was like, I don't have the psychic fortitude to deal with that amount of death. But he was a great doctor. What I do remember vividly is that every day in the mail, without fail, these journals would come in, different medical journals. And every night, what my dad would do after dinner was read journals. My entire childhood, all he did was wow. read medical journals. Why? Because there was too much information and he had to stay abreast of it because he was trying to save lives. And yeah. so any article on anything was important for him because he was building this vision of how to treat cancer. And you fast forward to today, and as I mentioned, you know, 491 million results in 0.7 seconds for just a term like generative AI. And you say, well, can AI serve a purpose in helping with this problem of too much information? And of course, the obvious answer is yes. And there are already great examples of this, especially when you start with visual based information. So yeah. take radiology or take dermatology, where they have proven now, and Stanford, I think, did this experiment a few years back. What they did was they actually trained an AI on images of skin. And yeah. I believe they used a couple million images of skin. And then they proved that the AI was as good, if not better, than the best dermatologist on detecting basal cell carcinomas, melanomas, all kinds of things. But it could do it instantaneously because it just looked at the image and it had the, the knowledge base, right? So you say, well, what if you could train an AI to learn to recognize and then respond to these things and make recommendations, which is the next step. So many people are familiar with what you do with generative AI when it comes to things like chat GPT or, yep. you know, stable diffusion or, you know, one of these kind of dolly kind of things. That's nice. But now imagine a world where you work in a hospital and you're a physician and you have 30 people on ventilators or on respiratory machines. Those ventilators all have settings very specific to the conditions of the patients. But then you have the vitals of the patients, which are in real time, right? Those vitals aren't static, yeah. they change. So what if somebody's vitals go out of whack such that the settings on the ventilator are no longer the right ones for that patient? Well, in today's world, until somebody actually goes and sees the patient and then sees the settings and then has the knowledge to put the two together and say, well, the correct settings at this time is this, that patient will keep being treated at the wrong settings indefinitely until it's fixed. Yep. But with generative AI, what you can do is actually now, the machine can be regularly monitored. It can actually see the vitals have changed. It can reference the knowledge base from the manufacturer of these are the settings at every one of these things. It can then proactively reach out to the doctor and say, hey, this patient has this, my recommendation, and this is the computer making the recommendation, says you should set it to this. Now, the doctor could say yes or no, but the doctor is using their intellect to make a decision. It's almost like if you ever saw the Iron Man movies, it's Jarvis. It is a yep, trusted co-pilot saying, this is what I recommend and this is what you need to do. And then the doctor ultimately, or, or Tony Stark, has the final say. But imagine what you can do when you have a world like that, especially in a world like healthcare, where one of our biggest constraints is the talent. And a lot of doctors are actually leaving the industry as well because they burned out after COVID or they're not willing to deal with the stress or fill in the blank, lots of issues. And it takes years to train a doctor. What if we could have the doctor stop spending 80% of their time typing into a computer notes from their meeting with the patient and spend that 80% on the patients? That's it where it's really difference. powerful. And I guess there's, however, also a flip side to the whole story. There is. It's, so the downside is, well, there's many downsides, but one of them is if you look at the history of technology in the first, second, third industrial revolutions, and then what we're going through now, there's always been a labor disruption. You go back 100 plus years, you had the Luddites breaking machines because they were afraid of losing their jobs in England in the textile mills, I believe it was. Every disruption eventually gets absorbed. People move to cities. You, in the 1950s, in offices, I still have seen photos of this, of rooms full of people at typewriters who were making copies of documents, right? Mm, well, yeah. then the Xerox machine came along and went away, the typing pool went and the carbon copy and all that. So you fast forward and every one of these technologies creates a disruption. The problem is the speed at which these technologies today can make a disruption. We don't have the current model that can absorb that kind of shock. And what I mean by that is every time a job has been taken by a machine, whether it's a physical machine like a cotton gin or a water powered saw in a, in a lumber mill or whatever, it's always been taking away jobs that allow people to move higher up the intellectual ladder, so to speak. And they can retreat to more brain required jobs because machines could never replicate brains, yep. except yep. now the machines are actually better than the human at the brain part because a machine can learn from 10 million medical cases 
like that, that a doctor never can. A machine can do a lot of these things. And it's not about, you know, artificial general intelligence or anything else. It's about a specific task that can be better done one way versus another. In the consulting world, I'll give you an example here. One of the things is people come in, most consulting firms tend to be a traditional pyramid where yep. you come in as an analyst, you work your way up and you eventually become a partner. And then you, in the old days, you'd have an office with a window, but now nobody goes to the office. <laughs> but analysts, a lot of what they would do, and they still do, is things like put together proposals and write RFP responses and do that sort of thing, which is how you win business. Now, imagine I took the last thousand RFP responses I put together for pharmaceutical companies as Accenture, for instance, and I gave it to an AI to learn from. And they also got the RFPs themselves. They could see what won and what didn't win. And then I said, make me a 10-page proposal deck that can win this RFP. The AI can do it literally like that. Within seconds. Just like I can ask a question to chat GPT now, and I can get an answer immediately. And it's usually coach it. Sure, still get the occasional hallucination, but not nearly as much as you think. And the partner can review it and go, change this, don't change that, and they're done. But what you just eliminated is the bottom of the pyramid. And in a company like an Accenture, which has now, I think, 800,000 employees, that's not a small bottom of a pyramid. So now you're taking jobs that were more what you consider people coming out of business school would get or these other kind of more professional employments. And you're saying, well, actually, I don't need those people. That disruption is going to roll through the white collar world. Traditionally, it was always the blue collar that got disrupted, right? Now it's like, no, now it's going to affect a lot of things. And what are those people going to do? Because what we don't have is a system that has universal basic income or all these other things. And you add into that the robots I mentioned a few minutes ago. For the gardening. Oh, not just gardening. But now imagine this. So Tesla, I have a Tesla, Model yep. 3. I love the car. And in fact, I just got another update yesterday, software update. I got in my car, opened the door in the morning, and the screen says, your software has been updated because they can do it over the air. I mean, oh, yeah. It's just fundamentally a different model because it's not a car. It's a program that happens to have wheels. And so they updated the software and it's got new safety features and all the rest. Well, imagine that robot in my house that costs, let's say $20,000. It doesn't just garden. Now there's a module I can upload. Maybe it's a subscription or maybe it's just a flat fee. And now it can do the dishes. It can do my laundry. It can clean the house. It can wash my dog, right? I mean, because these are very nimble, agile machines. But once you learn a skill, and this is a talk I saw on the flight back from Dubai, I watched a great podcast, Diary of CEO. I think I sent you the link to that episode, but it was with a gentleman from Google, and he was talking about how their robot hands that could pick up balls, like they had a room full of all these hands trying to pick up a ball, and none of them could do it correctly. And then one day, one of them picked it up, and he jokingly said, oh, look, you know, we spent $40 million so that a hand could pick up a ball. And the next day, they were all picking it up perfectly, every single one, because once you've solved something with software, replicating it is like that, and there's no marginal cost from an economics point of view. So if you come up with a new use for that robot, you can sell it to everybody who has that robot. Well, here's a use case, cleaning your hotel room. Now mm. imagine you take all those people who clean hotel rooms all across the country or all across the world, and you replace them with a robot that can perfectly clean a hotel room, never goes on strike, never needs a raise, never has a sick day, et cetera, et cetera. $20,000 for a robot versus an employee pays for itself in the first six months. And then you own it forever. And oh, by the way, it's a depreciable capital asset, which if you pay taxes, that's an important thing. So what's it going to do to all labor markets? It's terrifying because you no could doubt. argue we have about 4 billion too many people then. Part of the problem is we don't know what kinds of new jobs would replace or emerge from this. Yeah, that's, yet there's least. always the, oh, but there's another job just down the pike, right? Mm, I think we might actually finally get that world of leisure, but someone's got to pay for it. Yep. We'll just let that sink in a bit. <laughs> I myself have been looking at Gen AI for, well, I dabbled in it a bit last year playing with image generation. And I mean, it's incredible what it can do unless you're a deep expert in a particular area in the environment aspects. I'm just thinking biodiversity again. Unless you're very good with plants and flowers, you might be able to spot the subtle inaccuracies and how it generates these kinds of things. Like it has an extra leaf on the on the branch, like the extra finger on the hand. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the way it grows is not correct. But for most of the people, yep. they don't tend to notice these things. No, you're already starting to see some of this in the press now, especially with the recent thing with Taylor Swift and AI generated images. But the 2024 presidential campaign in the US is about to really ramp up. And the amount of deep fakes, which is a whole other area of generatable content that you could actually create your own voice using AI. You can train an AI with a very small amount of recording of your voice, and then it can pretty much perfectly mimic your voice, intonation, everything else. And then you just give it a script and it's talking on your behalf. 
but you can do that with other people's voices. And then how do you tell what's real and what's not? And the problem is that, as you know, politicians and regulation are always years behind technology, yeah. especially at the speed it's moving at. The horses will be out of the barn long before they get around to closing the door and figuring this out. And there are efforts to try and define what ethical use of AI is. But as you said, it's evolving way too quickly. Right. And the problem is it's the unethical people to begin with. They don't care what the ethical uses are. That's not what actually motivates them to do what they're doing. You can only hope we'll find a solution in the near future as the scene becomes more mainstream. I think we're going to have to have a crisis first before because crisis tends to be what actually gets people to take action. There's an old saying, you know, I think Winston Churchill once said that the U.S can be trusted to do the right thing after it's explored every other option, right? Mm. The old expression, arouse the sleeping giant. It takes a lot to get us moving. Eventually, we'll figure it out and we'll do it, whether it was the Apollo program or Operation Warp Speed with the vaccine for pandemic. Yep. That was incredibly fast, how we finally mobilized and kind of halted the first wave of the pandemic in its tracks with the first vaccines that came out. But I think we need to have some sort of watershed moment with a bad outcome from AI. I'm just hoping it's not the bad outcome that people like Elon fear where yeah. the AI gets sentient, and then we're really screwed. <laughs> but I guess the twin crises to deal with, climate change and AI, it's going to be an interesting future. Yeah, but you know, actually thinking about it in kind of in real time, you know, what if you made an army of robots and all they did was go around and plant trees? But the right trees in the right yeah. place. They don't get tired. So they can work all day, all night. They can plant a lot of trees. You know, there's that whole project, the Trillion Trees Project, right? Which is, you know, take a big number, put a marketing campaign behind it, and that's going to save us. <laughs> but there is a little bit of truth to it. You get enough activity out there, we can start to reverse this ridiculous decimation we're still doing to like places like the Amazon and others that we're mm. just deforesting the whole time we're sitting here talking. Now, granted, the Amazon doesn't actually create our oxygen. I learned that watching a really interesting documentary. It comes primarily from the ocean, but deforesting the Amazon makes no sense, especially to turn it into cattle grazing land. And why do we graze cattle? To grow soy. What do we grow the soy for? It's not to feed people. It's primarily yep. to feed other animals because we have this crazy consumption model that we have in this world. And we'll definitely have to sit down and do a part two once we see a bit more developments here <laughs> because, I mean, it's fascinating to listen to, I guess, the depth of knowledge and just the curiosities you have to all these different grand challenges that we do face. We have a lot of grand challenges, but I do believe... So I'm going to throw out a provocative statement because yep. I do that from time to time. So here's my thesis. Virtually every problem we have today wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a root cause problem that nobody talks about. Or if they do, they talk about it the wrong way. And the problem is that at the time of the Apollo program, when we landed on the moon, there were about 3 billion people on this planet. There are now 8 billion people on this planet. You would not have the carbon problem. You would not have the overfishing problem. You would not have the plastic and the pollution problem. You would not have the drought problem. You would not have most of these problems if we didn't have 5 billion extra people on this planet. But we don't ever want to talk about it that way. And I'm not saying go out and kill 5 billion people, right? So just be clear, I'm not advocating for, you know, euthanizing a huge portion of the population. But we also perversely actually perpetuate the problem of population growth through other programs that we do because of the law of unintended consequences. We don't look at, well, let's go and enable this. And then 30 years later, you've created this whole raft of problems because you're trying to do the right thing here without realizing what was actually happening. No, certainly not up for massive population deflation, but it is certainly um, one of the drivers. I mean, we always say urbanization, population growth, and climate change are causing all sorts of other problems, but they're inherently interlinked, just like many of the other environmental aspects we've discussed as well. They are. And the population, you don't have to advocate for massive population reduction. It's happening on its own because as you become more economically well off, you tend to have less children. It's mm. just this very clear pattern. The problem we have is that the current economic model we built at a global level is based on a pyramid scheme. And that pyramid scheme is social programs that only work as long as you always have more people contributing than you did before. Whether it's social security in the US, mm. it's pensions in China or anywhere else, the model falls apart when the lower part of the pyramid, again, gets smaller than the upper part, but that's actually, China's facing that right now. They're actually looking at a decreasing and aging population, just like Japan faced starting 40 years ago. And look at how well that worked out for them. Italy's got the same problem. It's happening in a number yeah, of places. Yeah, I think South Korea as well. I've heard of yeah. that. And it's the natural cycle, you could call it, because policies were put in place, but the effects are only seen many years down the road, decades even. And then you do course correction and it takes a few more decades to change again. Yeah. Or if you want to go back to the natural world in biology, you'd say we don't have 
our own apex predator above us. And so Mm -hmm. we are like deer in the U.S. now because we've systematically wiped out their predators, whether it's wolves or coyotes or bears or whatever else, the things that they would hunt the deer. We have like where I live, massive overpopulation of deer. When you're driving at night, you have to drive slowly because they will jump out in front of your car. It almost happened to me last night driving home from this conference within 10 miles of my house. Deer jumped out on the road. I hit the brakes because I was watching and it went on its way. But we don't have that, right? There's nothing above us on that thing other than things like COVID and SARS and other kinds of little tiny things that can take us out. Shabra, this has been an incredible conversation of two very distinct topics, but somehow interrelated really through us society. And like I do with every guest, I'd love to ask you a few questions that I ask everyone just so that listeners can learn a lot more about you. And I guess the one that is most suited to start with is if you had a magic wand and with the wave of this wand, you could change something overnight, what would that be? I would I would make everybody a vegan. Ah, okay. Interesting. So I'll expand on that a bit. It's not that I am against necessarily eating meat, although I am a vegan myself. It's actually the modern world has some really dark underbelly to it. And I think one of them is how we produce food on this planet. Because virtually everybody I know who has been exposed to it has, after their initial recoiling and horror, changed their diet that fast. Because we don't want to know about how our food is produced. But what we do to produce our food, like I mentioned before with the Amazon and soy production and deforestation, we have plenty of food on this planet that could feed all 8 billion people, even though I said I think you know 3 billion would probably be better from a climate impact and other points of view. We have plenty of food. The problem is we're misallocating it and misusing it to sustain these kinds of practices. If you look at human diet and history, we were not mostly meat eaters most of our existence. This is very much a Western modern thing. And you look at the rise in diabetes, obesity, heart disease, all these other things that now we have to spend trillions of dollars on healthcare on and pharmaceuticals and everything else. It all goes back to root cause. And I'm a big believer in you have to understand the root cause of a problem and not put a bandaid on a bullet hole, but actually go and look at what's causing the underlying systemic issue and address that. So my magic wand is if I got everybody to stop eating meat, the impact it would have across a whole range of industries, including transportation and fuel consumption and all those other things, but then also animal suffering because the systems created today are not anything that I think any farmer from 500 years ago would look at and say, that makes sense. You know, they're horrific. We could get rid of that. That's what I would do. That's a very interesting insight that I think we don't know enough about. And maybe we're starting to learn a bit. Also, this whole food waste issue that people are talking a lot about in the news now and there are programs and apps that allow you to sort of go to the supermarket or restaurants to pick up leftovers. I guess with time, we start to become more aware of these practices. And yeah, with the growing population we talked about just now, if it keeps growing, we're going to have to find alternative solutions. And maybe that is going to be something in the future, going back to the roots, going back to the prehistoric era. Maybe understanding those habits a bit more again. I guess we're starting to do it in the self-development area a bit, in the psychology area a bit, as well as understanding where our anxieties are coming from and what the human brain is meant to do and how it's adapted. As time passes, this is going to be applied to other areas too. Well, and and this actually brings our conversation full circle because when we were talking before about how the philosophers and the scientists and now policy get together and they do what the philosophers have known for thousands of years around the benefits of nature on health, for instance, in the same way, we're going to go back to these are the sustainable ways that we produce food. This is what we eat. But I'll tell you what's interesting. When I was at Salesforce years ago, they have a really cool internal communication system. At the time, it was called Chatter. It was like a, a Slack before they bought it. Okay. And in addition to all the different channels you could set up for work-related things, a company project of this or that, whatever else, they actually had channels for every building. And there was a channel on there. It was called Free Food 50 Fremont, which was the building that I was in, 50 Fremont Street. And it was a practice and it was cultural, right? It was a cultural thing that everybody just knew about. When you joined the company, you learned about it and you knew about it, which was whenever you would have a meeting and you would cater food in, there would always be leftover food. Uh-huh. And so what you would do is you'd go, as soon as the meeting was done, you'd go into that channel, whoever had that meeting or organized it, would go in and very quickly just say, leftovers from blah, 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 restaurant, 32nd floor, this conference room. And people no, would just Andy. come down and it was all gone, right? <laughs> Vultures. <laughs> it, was, it was. But what you got rid of was waste. Yep. And... What we lack is a good frictionless distribution system about both the information of what exists and then access to it. And that's true on food waste as well, because we waste a ton of food in this country. 
and coming full circle as well, reducing the friction, mm-hmm. giving people the information that they need right. rather than information overload. Exactly. What inspires you to do what you do on a daily basis when you wake up every morning? What is that one driving force nowadays? Because you've been through so many different journeys and I guess nature brings it together, wanting to innovate brings it together. But how would you define that inspiration? So it's interesting. It's actually, it's a battle. I'll say this. So the thing that inspires me and makes me do what I'm doing right now is because I want to leave a better world for my kids than I think we are as a generation doing right now and the previous generation has done. And it worries me. So that's the obvious practical reason for it. But there's an old, I think it's an indigenous American, Native American story, but it might be for another part of the world in which case I apologize for getting the wrong place. But I remember the story, which is the story of the two wolves and that you have two wolves inside of you. And, you know, kind of the optimistic and the pessimistic. And you have to decide which one you feed and which one's going to win that battle every day. And every day I go through this because it's easy to get pessimistic, despondent, to look at all this and just throw up your hand and say, you know what, it's screwed. I'll get the best I can for me and for mine, which is unfortunately what most people try to do. It's like, I'm going to maximize for me and mine, not because they're narcissists, but because it just seems so overwhelming and so big and so like, I can drive an electric car. I'm not changing the carbon in the atmosphere, not by any measurable amount. I can take a shorter shower, but I'm not really solving the drought, right? All these things are too big. The plastic in the Pacific Ocean, it's the size of Texas. What the hell is my straw going to do for that? I'll still use the metal straw because it's the right thing to do. But what I guess keeps me going when every now and then I go to that, that dark side is I do believe that Again, it might take a crisis, but we will find a better way out of this because I do believe that the arc always bends in the positive direction, that if we really were going to go the other direction, if bad wins, we wouldn't be here having this conversation because we never would have gotten here. Do we go through dark times over and over and over again? Hopefully we can learn from them and move on. What makes me sad is on one level that we have to keep driving species to extinction while we're doing that. The very philosophical part of me is like, yeah, but 95% of all species that have ever existed are gone, right? So it's like, to me, the most important thing is that the force of life never gets extinguished because that's unique. Whether we're the ones who get off the planet or it's dolphin people or it's, you know, I don't know what, something else, that'll be figured out long after I'm dead. But we have to make sure that we don't destroy the one habitat we have as life, which is this planet. And so for me... What gets me inspired about what we do with Garden for Wildlife is that we're helping people make a noticeable difference in their own yard because that's not too big for them to think about. That's not too big for them to have a difference on. And they do see a difference. And we get the emails all the time and the pictures that our customers are sending in. Like, I just saw my first Eastern Bluebird. Never seen one before. I just saw my first Swallowtail. Never seen one before. But when they show their kids and their kids are seeing these things, now we're starting to really make a difference because if you can impress on them when they're young, You've got them for life. And they often say, you teach kids, they teach their parents. And this is how the knowledge spreads and the awareness spreads. Yeah. But it's incredible to see that, hey, you can empower so many people. It's also a reason why I do this podcast, because I feel like everyone has a story to tell and everyone can make a difference. And if you can give them a stage where they can really reflect, and then that can reach many different people of different walks of life, I think then you know you've done a little part to try and pass on that good energy. Call it that. You know, if even one person listens to this and starts putting native plants in their yard, whether they get them from us is irrelevant. I would, of course, love more customers. But as long as they start putting that in, if they garden and if they don't get a pot, like just one planter on your patio and put some in and you're helping. I certainly mentioned on episode 10 that I'm back with my house plants, but I'm certainly going to be trying again this summer or yeah. this spring, actually. That's the best time to start. Well, right? Peter, I'll tell you, house plants you're always going to be fighting a battle because plants didn't evolve to live inside an apartment. That's but true. I meant on the plants, balcony. Yeah, but native plants on your balcony, if they're in the environment they're supposed to be in, take very little maintenance because they evolved to be there. Yeah. Not on your balcony, but in that area with that climate, with that sunshine, with that, all that kind of stuff. And so I'll definitely take a tip from you. Once I get to that stage, I've got the pots ready. Yep. I just got to go look for the native plants native to my postcode. So yes. I'll check and, out what Switzerland has. I'll be happy to connect you with folks who have it since we're not in that part of the world yet. No, definitely. You mentioned Nature's Best Hope as one of the key books that really influenced and changed the course of your career. Was there any other key moments, book, person, events that also had this effect on you? Yeah, I'll tell you, there were probably three or four things that have had the most profound effect. Nature's Best Hope, 
It was funny when I had lunch with Dr. Talamy back in October, I felt a little bit like you had mentioned Phil the Dreams, the, the movie. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in there where Kevin Costner first meets James Earl Jones, who's the writer, and he comes to his apartment in Boston and he's like, I need you to come back with me. And he's like, he's like, when I read your book and he's like, oh, you're one of those. You're that hippie. Right. And he tries to like <laughs> shoo him away with the spray. And I'm afraid of that scene because I felt like Kevin Costner in that scene when I went to see Dr. Talamy, we're sitting at lunch. And I said, your book changed my life. And he's, he had that kind of like where he looked at his face, like, no, no, you don't understand. This company wouldn't exist had I not read your book. So literally, I would still be doing my consulting thing at Accenture and just like, you literally changed the course of my life with this book. So that absolutely is the first one I'd cite. Actually, one that I shared a lot with people when I was doing the work at Salesforce and then at Accenture was there's the original TEDx talk that Simon Sinek did in, ah, I think, yeah. Seattle on the Golden Circle, which led to his book, Start With Why, and led to a bunch mm -hmm. of other things he's done. He's obviously, he's very famous now. But the concept was so clear about the why, how, and what of an organization or a leader. And I've always focused on the why. Like, yeah. the, what is the thing that drives what you're doing? And I always like tell my own team, we have to make sure our why is really clear because then people will come with us on this journey, right? And our why is to help restore the habitat for the health of the wildlife and the people who live in it, right? And that's really important. There's two other books I'll mention just because they're both quite good. One that I did mention before is The Nature Fix, which I highly recommend to everybody, which mm. actually goes into the science of how exposure to nature actually helps with your mental and physical well-being, which we're now finding. In fact, we're working with a university in Syracuse that's done research in this area of the veterans. And how do you combat social isolation and depression through gardening? And they actually found it has measurable improvement. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is important. And for veterans, which is a real big issue in our country, because like even veteran suicide is just a horrible thing that's off the charts right now. The second one is Richard Liu wrote a book back in I think it was 2007 called Last Child in the Woods. So you might notice a theme here, right? Uh -huh, Last Child in yep. the Woods actually compared and contrasted our childhoods. And I still remember this, you know, you go out and play in vacant lots and in fields and walk in the woods and do all of that. Even in Southern California, there were parks and things you'd go to that were pretty wild. And today you look at kids and they have very structured lives, they have very structured playtime. There's a great organization that came out of that work that he did. It's called the Children in Nature Network. And they actually focus a lot on this, which is oh, how do you drive more childhood engagement with nature, with unstructured playtime and things that actually have a measurable connection to things like ADHD and other issues. Because if you think about us as a species and we've evolved over thousands of years, we've introduced electronics and these things in the last 15 there's no possible way we are set up to operate in this. And it's proven these are actually bad for your concentration. Yes. Things like multitasking is actually now shown scientifically to damage your brain. But we've created a world that we are getting the serotonin rush every time you get a notification or you get a this. So you have to turn them off. You have to put them away. But it's like giving power tools to a three-year-old. We're just not ready for it. No, we're not. And our brains are not evolved for that. And no. I'm not sure if it's the serotonin. I think it's the dopamine. Dopamine. Sorry, it's the yeah. dopamine. Thank it's you. It's the dopamine rush that we get. And it's, yep. yeah, it's engineered for that attention grabbing nature. And right. yeah, we need focused time or we need a focused atmosphere or environment to be able to do work or to do play and to learn from that. And in a way, they're just breaking that focus. So. And you said before with specialization, right? The people who come up with things like gamification and badging and all mm -hmm. the other things, they're not bad people. But no, their job is not. to focus on how do I get you to click the most times on this? Or how do I get you to yeah. buy this thing? Or how do you whatever else? And they don't think about the bigger implications because that's not what they're paid to do. But I like the themes of the books that you have. And we'll definitely put some recommendations in the show notes. I have certainly read Start With Why. And so I can certainly agree. As a researcher, we need to be able to define the problem that we want to address yep. and formulate our research around that. And it's incredibly important because too often you don't understand the big picture as someone from the outside looking in. And then you just start to wonder, like, is this just another rehashing of the wheel? Right. So no, I certainly know that. And some friends I know have also read that book. Definitely recommend that. So we'll definitely put those in. Nice to see that, yeah, that nature connection in these key moments. Yeah. You just reminded me of the last book, which is one of my favorite authors ever, Douglas Adams, who, of course, wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yep, he classic. wrote a book that was the book companion to a radio series with the BBC that he did. He went on a journey with a wildlife biologist, I believe, 
And the book is called Last Chance to See. It came out in the mid-1990s. Fantastic book. Okay. Unfortunately, one of the species that they went to see in the book is already extinct now, right? But the whole point was oh, they were no. going to visit species that were on the very edge. So the Yangtze Blind River Dolphin in China or the Komodo Dragon in Komodo or et cetera, et cetera. They went to go look at a number of specific species. But he writes it in his usual humorous tone. So you'll laugh all the way through the book. But then the ending of the book that his co-author, the biologist, wrote, and it was a parable. Actually, I can't remember the name of the parable. But it's fairly famous, but I'd never heard it before. And it's about a woman who comes to a city, this fictitious city, and she comes to the gates of the city. And the city is very prosperous. And she says, I have 16 books with all the knowledge of the world, and I will sell them to you for one bag of gold. And the city's like, well, we don't need it. We're doing great. Why would we do this? And she goes, OK, that's fine can I borrow some wood for a fire? And they said, sure. So they gave her some wood because they were a prosperous city. And she proceeds to burn eight of the books and leaves. And they're a little horrified, but think she's kind of crazy. She leaves. A year later, she comes back. The city's a little less well off, still doing pretty good. And she says, I have eight books with half the knowledge of the whole world. And it's two bags of gold. And they said, well, wait a minute. Last year, 16 for one bag. Now it's eight for two bags. That's four times increase wow. in the price. We can't afford that. That's kind of crazy. Maybe how about one bag? And then she's like, nope, that's fine. Can I borrow some wood? And they give her some more wood, and she proceeds to burn half the books again. Goes away. The next year she comes back. It's a lot worse there. Things have gotten bad. And it's the exact same dialogue. At which she, she says, can I have, now it's eight bags of gold for four uh, books. She says, can I have some wood? No, we're kind of wow. low on resources. She goes, that's fine. And she tears up the paper of those four books, and she's able to start a fire anyway. Burns those books. So she's down to two books, does this one more time. Eventually she comes back. And now the city is despondent, right? It's it's a horrible situation. Yep. Their farms are failing. There's this, that, all these problems. And she says, I have one book that has one sixteenth of all the knowledge in the known world. And I'm going to sell it to you for 16 bags of gold. And they said, but we can't afford that. And so she's like, okay, well, they said, but we really need it. So they ended up paying the price and they get one sixteenth of what they got before for 16 times the price. And mm. the metaphor is clear, right? We are destroying yeah. the world around us without ever understanding it. And the implications, whether it's a collapse of our food stocks in the oceans or it's going to be the impacts of the changing climate, whether or not you believe it's anthropomorphic, it's irrelevant. No one really can say the climate is not changing. So you look at all these things and you say, at what point do we finally go, okay, now we have to invest the $40 trillion it takes to fix the problem because we weren't willing to spend, again, cost of poor quality or yep. whatever you want to call it, what it takes to fix it when it would have only been $100 billion. <laughs> Yeah, I'm speechless. I love the parable. That's an incredible story. I have to look it up and read it myself. Yeah, and you'll laugh when you read the book because there's a part where he goes to Australia and the, I won't ruin the dialogue, but it's I, I'll never forget the quotes because it was such a funny interaction that to this day, I regularly cite that one scene from the book. But Douglas Adams, of course, was a genius writer. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I do enjoy some of Douglas Adams's work that I've looked at so far. I'll check that out. Please. What was one of the most challenging situations that you've ever faced in your career to date? And how did you overcome it? Wow, that's a good question. So one of the most challenging situations in my career, well, I'll actually work on the startup side because startups are the hardest thing ever. And it still is. You know, this is not my first time as CEO. I've started a number of companies, some of which have been successful and some of which were euphemistically called great learning experiences, but are also called failures. And yeah. the first time a startup fails is hard. It's traumatic because you're not just responsible for you. You're responsible for all the people who work for you because ultimately they look to you as being the person. So you also can't share with them all that's going on because you mm -hmm. have to maintain a front of everything's going great. Because if you start to say, well, we've got this problem, this problem, this problem, what's the first thing any normal human being will do is start looking for the exits, which only accelerates the problem, right? So you have yeah. to... Deal with it alone as a CEO, which is why they say the CEO job is the loneliest one out there. And this is not me whinging. It's not meant to sound that way. But it's just the first time that you do still fail, then it's all on your shoulders. Because then all you do is go, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do? What's interesting is almost every CEO I know or entrepreneurial CEO I know has failed multiple times. So once you get over it, it's easier to go and do the next one. Because you realize actually, you know, 80% of small businesses fail. So you're not like in rare company. And they fail mm. for all the obvious reasons. What you're trying to do is something that most people will never do. And that's hard. And that requires a different mindset. But once you've become an entrepreneur, it's hard to ever not keep becoming one. Because you're always looking at problems and saying, someone should solve that. And then you go, well, I guess I'll yeah. solve it. Because no one else will do it. The key is finding something that you care enough about that you're going to keep working at it when it gets hard and when it gets boring and the rest. Which is why I love what I do right now. Because... 
I actually believe in this mission and I care about this mission. If I was just doing a startup where we were selling a widget, there are times where we're like, yeah, it's not worth the effort. I can go make, you know, 10x this just working in the traditional professional services world. But I actually enjoy what I'm doing. And so that's, I'm lucky. I mean, I pinch myself. I get to like do this business for a living. I do it as a hobby. So I still have all the stresses of a CEO and the rest. And I've got a great team that makes that a lot easier. But I wouldn't trade it. No. And I guess, yeah, failure is part of the great learning experience, as they call it. Yeah. Well, we but we fail our entire life, right? The first time you try to walk, you get up, you fall over. You get like life is about failure and learning from it. Yeah. But when you get coached in life, like, I mean, I'll be blunt. I failed out of college. It was traumatic. And then I got back on that horse and I breathed my way through it because I was doing it for the wrong reasons. And once I figured out what I needed to do and I did it for the right reasons, I enjoyed it and I did very well at it. We are conditioned, especially in modern society. This is not a Western thing. I mean, (laughs) I joke with my kids because my kids are biracial. They're my wife who's white and I'm South Asian. But we joke about the Asian stereotype in education, right? It's like a B is failure. You get my my kids joke about that all the time now. I'm like, you know, you get an A. Why didn't you get an A plus? Right? It's it's like um, (laughs) I know those jokes all too well too. But we have this stigma that is carried with us from early on. Thou shalt not fail. And I keep telling my kids fail now. It doesn't cost anything, right? Try something. Just never stop trying. Because when you stop trying is when you stop living. Yep. Valuable lesson for life, indeed. Something I also try to remind myself every day and to keep moving. And that's how you build resilience. Well, you did your first podcast episode and now you're dozens later, right? But when you started, you had no idea where it was going. And it has been a lovely journey so far. And yeah, lots of moments where I'm like, ah, I got to restart. I got to do this again. Or I have to figure out. Delete this whole interview if you want, you know. (laughs) Ah, no, no, no. (laughs) Certainly not. (laughs) But nah, thanks for sharing. And on the topic of tips. What tips and strategies can you offer in terms of time management? I mean, how do you maintain a balance between the professional and personal life? You mentioned you're doing your hobby for a living, but I guess there's yep. often times, you know, spent doing the business, running the business, yeah. and then there's time spent with family. Yeah, so I think the biggest single thing you can learn to do is delegate. And I'll be honest, it's taken me a while to learn this and really start to actually implement it, which is to let go of things. Trust other people do it. They may not always do it exactly the way I would do it, They may not always do it correctly. Again, they could fail, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean I have to control everything. And that's an important part, especially if you want to scale something, you can't always control every lever. From a work-life balance, it's the same thing I tell my whole team. You know, one of the things I did when I first got here was I instituted a policy of unlimited PTO. We don't have vacation time. I'm like, look, just take time when you need it. You've got tasks, you've got jobs, you've got things to do. Work with your supervisor, make sure that it's always on task, whatever else. But then if you want to take a three-day weekend and go hiking with your friends, or you want to go do spend time, whatever else, or if you want to be free from three to five because your kids get home from school, that's fine. It's up to you. This isn't that orthodoxy of it's a nine-to-five job, right? It's not. But then you might be working on a weekend because we have deliveries going out or whatever. I think it's important to prioritize what matters to you. And I think too many people figure this out late in life. I read a number of really good books on this side around people at the end of their lives and Most people don't say, I wish I had been in more meetings or I had been in, you know, whatever the thing is. It's always the things I regret. And to me, and why we first moved here to Maryland, in part, a big part was I was spending too much time away from my kids and they were growing up too fast. And I have friends now who just recently had children or just now having like one of the guys on my team, they're having a daughter in June. And I said, look, the best advice I got, I didn't listen to it enough, but I listened to it now a lot more was the days are long, the years are short. So you can get frustrated with kids for all kinds of reasons, but you will blink and that little kid won't be there anymore. It'll be like my son who is now 14 and wears my clothes. He wears my suits. He wears my shoes, right? And I love my son of today. I miss my son of six years old. And I'm like, where did he go? And the same thing with my daughter, right? And so I do a lot more with them now. I'm very active in both their scout troops. I'm going on a camping trip this weekend. I've spent more time in tents in the last two years than in my entire life. Because I actually enjoy it. I enjoy camping That's with lovely. them and doing the scout stuff. But it's about being involved in their lives because I did not have that luxury. My dad was too busy working and being the doctor that I talked about before. So I spent very little time with him. So when you ask about time management, I'd say, and I tell this to people all the time, no pun intended, is it is the only asset you have of value. 
you can make money, you can lose money. I have made money. I've lost all of my money. I've made money again. Entrepreneurs do this regularly. But you want to just go make a lot of money, go to business school, go to Wall Street, be done with it. And you'll be miserable, but you'll be rich. Time is the only thing you have of value because even Bill Gates or Elon Musk can't buy a second of time back. They can buy things that help them optimize the time they have, but they'll never get back the time that's gone. Fixed asset. So really think about what you're going to spend your time on because tragic case, you could die in a car accident tomorrow. And then, well, yeah. those plans for things you're going to do 20 years from now, gone. It doesn't mean be a narcissist and shirk all responsibility, but you still have to plan that you will be here in 20 years and plan accordingly. Otherwise, you'll have no savings, no house, no whatever. But don't miss the opportunities that are walking past your door every day because you're waiting. And don't do it scrolling. Sorry, Zuckerberg, but don't spend your time on Instagram or Facebook or anything else because that's just a waste of time. Ask yourself this. All those things you liked six months ago on somebody's feed, do you even remember what they were, especially the memes and all that other stuff? No, of course not. Even just the last time you opened the app. Right. So that's yeah. part of the thing. These have become addictive tools that we don't remember. So it's a great tool for what it's used for. Another little tip and trick that actually one of my colleagues, uh, Renato Scaff Accenture, he's now, I think, the CEO here in North America. He actually did this at a meeting. We had a leadership meeting. And I tell this to everybody who's listening to this podcast. You can do this with your own teams at wherever you work. There are these cool little cases you can get. It's a microfibers bag. It's like you use for eyeglasses, but it's the size of a phone. Okay. And you can get them on Amazon yeah. or anywhere else. And you can have them, a logo put on them if you want to actually put your company or whatever on there. But it's just plain black color or whatever color you want. But it's we call them a sleeping bag for your phone. Because it turns out when you take your phone and you put it in that bag, even if you set it on the table, you're not seeing your phone. And when you're not seeing it, you're not feeling the impulse to look at it. And it turns out it actually works. You're increasing the friction to get to it. It's too. almost like a out of sight, out of mind. But it's still there on the table. It's just inside this bag. So you don't yeah. see it. And we're visually picking it up in the side of our field of vision and going, oh, there's my phone. I should probably check and see if I got an email. 30 years ago, you didn't have email. No, so. we had the bricks, the Nokia 3310. I remember that very well. I remember that. With Snake. Do, 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 do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very true. I think your lessons about time is very important. We too often forget that time is our most valuable asset. Yeah. And I think we need to value that a lot more. And so thank you for this time. And to the listeners, and I say this in all sincerity, if you've actually listened through to this point, thank you for the time. And I hope it's been worth your time. I mentor companies, I mentor individuals, and I always start and end with, I'm happy to do this as long as it's worth your time. If it's not, I can do other things. But if it's actually worthwhile, then let's do it. And thank you for your time too, because it's been fascinating to hear your story and just to have this beautiful conversation of a whole range of topics. And you've given us a lot of gems of wisdom and a lot of advice that I think young people can also take on board and to really practice. And that's the most important thing. But as we wrap up the show, where can people find you if they want to get in touch? I'm on LinkedIn. I'm the only person with my name in the US. So it's just linkedin.com slash in slash Shabar Ali. And that's me, right? If you look for Shabar Ali, I think I'm the only one you'll find. If you're ever in the DC area, please give me a little advance warning. First, connect with me on LinkedIn and then shoot me a note. And I would love to grab a coffee, go out for a meal, whatever, if you'd like to meet up. I cherish the connections. So that's the easiest place to find me. And then, of course, if you're in the US and you're listening to this, buy native plants for your yard or your balcony. And we'll definitely put a link to that as well as your LinkedIn and other ways people can get in touch in the show notes so that listeners can learn a lot more about what we spoke about today and about you as well. Thank you. Shabar, thank you so much for coming onto the show and for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom in this incredible conversation. Like I do with every guest of the show, I always give you the final message. So one last message for the listeners to take away from today. Yeah, I would say after you're done listening to this, close your computer, your phone, whatever else you're doing, go outside and take a walk outside, listen to the birds, enjoy some nature, and remember that feeling. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And that wraps up our amazing and broad-ranging episode with Shabar Ali. To obtain some native plants for your garden, learn more about how AI will change our lives, or just some further wisdom on innovation and startups, check out the show notes for more information over at peterandbuff.com slash podcast. And as always, thank you listeners for tuning in to this episode and for your feedback and support. If you're enjoying this show, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this podcast with your family, friends, colleagues, and even fellow innovators. Please also do subscribe or follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. If you're curious about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website or social media. 
head to petermbach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Peter M. Bach, or Instagram, at Peter M. Bach 87 Feel free to reach out to me with any feedback or guest suggestions so that I can keep improving this show. The podcast intro and outro song is called Starsky by Alex Kieran. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guests to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges.